Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on LinkedIn Live and Twitter for today's Meet the Analyst webinar, the State of U.S. E-Commerce and 2020 Holiday Preview. I'm Nicole Perrin, Principal Analyst at eMarketer. I'm remote in Chicago, and I'm joined this morning by my colleague, Principal Analyst Andrew Lipsman, who's right across town. Hi, Andrew. It's great to have you with us. Hi, Nicole. Great to be here. I'd like to thank Outbrain for making today's webinar possible. We'll be hearing later on from Matt Peterson, Outbrain's Head of Enterprise Partnerships. A few things before we dive into Andrew's presentation. I know he has a ton of information to share, but there's no need to take notes. We'll email you a link to view the slides and the full recording. We also want you to participate. Just use the window on the lower right-hand side of your screen to submit questions at any time during the presentation, and we'll answer as many of those as we can during the Q&A. If your colleagues haven't registered yet but still want to join, no problem. Just share the same link that you use to register. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. Andrew, what's on your agenda for us this morning? Thanks, Nicole. All right, so I'm going to be talking about the state of U.S. e-commerce, um, where we're at at this point in, in the year, and a 2020 holiday preview. Um, this has been a year unlike any other in history. Um, obviously, we're in the midst still of a global pandemic, and that has created all sorts of changes. Um, I've been following e-commerce and holiday e-commerce since 2005, so this will be my 16th year. I'd like to say that um, I've seen it all. And up until this year, I believe that I had uh, the dynamics that are, that are gonna affect this year um, really are transformative. And so I think it's that much more important to get a handle on what's going on. So with that, here's a quick overview of what we'll be looking at. Uh, I'm gonna take a quick high level overview of global e-commerce so we can kind of set the stage for what's happening around the world and then put the US in that context. Then I'll focus on what we're seeing in terms of US retail and e-commerce, what we're expecting for the year. We'll get into some key category trends, key retailer trends, and then we'll take a look at a holiday 2020 early preview, um, which will include some predictions and then also some tips for marketers along the way. So let's start with global e-commerce. What's happening around the world? Once again, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, we're at different stages of recovering that, from that across the world. Um, so what we're seeing is a lot of differences country by country, and I'll unpack that a little bit in the next slide. But broadly speaking, we're seeing a bit of a deceleration in global e-commerce growth. The last couple of years, we've been over 20% growth year over year. This year, we're expecting that to decline to 16 0.8%. So the broad factors, the key vectors, I would say, that are affecting global e-commerce are, one, demand. So we are sort of in a global recession, and those headwinds are creating something of a demand shock. But then there's also this channel shifting effect as people have gone into shelter in place, uh, social distancing, trying to stay out of stores. That's taken some of those dollars that normally would have transacted in brick and mortar and moved them over to online, in some cases temporarily, in some cases it will be somewhat permanent. So those are the key things to have in mind um, and that we're going to try and wrap our heads around. Here we're taking a look at the top 10 e-commerce markets and we're looking at the 2019 and 2020 expected uh, spending totals for e-commerce and then also the percent change. So right up at the top is China. This is the big driver of global e-commerce. You can see just how much bigger it is than all of the other markets. It's about three times the size of the U.S., which itself is many multiples larger than the number three, four, and five players. Uh, now, China is really affected by the demand headwinds. So you'll see that that growth rate, which had been very aggressively over 20% in recent years, is now expected to be about 16%. The US is a bit higher there at 18%. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more because we're actually uh, in the process of updating our forecast. And you can expect some of these numbers uh, to move upward pretty considerably based on what we're now seeing in e-commerce. Uh, take these numbers directionally and I'll kind of talk through at a high level what we're expecting. So the U.S. 
is overperforming in large part because uh, we have had the uh, stubborn and persistent pandemic effect that has shifted a higher percentage of retail into e-commerce channels. Uh, some of the next markets, UK, Japan, also kind of pulling down that global average. As you get to the bottom of the list, you see India, Canada, and Spain. All of them are actually still growing at over 20%, uh, which is strong. But in India and Spain in particular, they were actually upwards of 30% last year. So those numbers are starting to come down quite a bit. So in the context of e-commerce spending, we also want to look at digital ad spend worldwide. Um, and so the key thing to look at here is what those growth rates had been in kind of the upper teens for the last few years. And you'll see 2020, we're expecting it to dip to 2.4%. Two ways to look at that. That's a pretty big deceleration, but we're in the midst of a global ad recession across all channels. And so the fact that, that digital ad spend is keeping its head above water is a positive sign in some respects. Um, and that's driven in large part because those dollars are kind of fueling right into e-commerce. So as e-commerce is stronger, that's gonna help prop up that digital ad spend number uh, more than where it would otherwise be. If we unpack what's happening within digital ad spend worldwide, what we see is that there has been an ongoing shift in the direction of display ad spending um, that will accelerate a bit here in 2020, a jump from 52.4% of global digital ad spend to 53.9%. What's interesting is that we think of display as traditionally being about uh, brand building advertising. And brand building is where you're more likely to see advertising cutbacks. Uh, but because we've seen such a shift in recent years in display driving performance advertising, it's actually held up well. So it can perform both of those functions fairly well. Search itself has exposure to some categories that have really just dried up from a marketing spend standpoint, travel, entertainment. Um, some of those are higher ticket search terms as well. So um, that has, has uh, put a damper on search spend globally. Thanks, Andrew, for that global perspective and really interesting information about ad spending trends. Um, you know, I cover ad spending and we see a lot of similar trends going on within the U.S. specifically. Um, I'd love to hear more about what's going on in the U.S. specifically with respect to retail sales as well. Yes. So this has been a really interesting year so far. A lot of things at play. So um, again, I'll just reiterate that the, the forecast data that I'm sharing here we undertook this forecast in April in the very early days of the pandemic when we didn't have a great handle on the magnitude of the effect. The directionality of everything I'm gonna talk about still holds true, um, but the magnitude has been even more pronounced in the direction of e-commerce than we had imagined. So just keep that in mind. Um, that forecast was uh, at the time we showed an acceleration or expected an acceleration from kind of the low to mid teens in e-commerce to 18%, which would be the highest in you know, about 10 years at least, um, to 700 billion plus dollars this year. Uh, that's the first year that we would see an incremental $100 billion of spend moving online for the first time. So just a huge new pool of money that's moving into e-commerce channels. Like I said, that's only gonna get bigger as we move throughout the year. The share shift also that we're looking at here in that blue line shows the single biggest jump. We had been seeing that share shift jump about a single percentage point each year. You can see it went from about 10% to 11%. Well, here it jumps to 14.5% in 2020. So there have been some pr really profound channel shifting behaviors. Along those lines, retail ad spending growth, similar to what we saw on a global basis, um, this is looking specifically at the retail vertical, though. In the U.S., we see that that dipped from 16% growth last year to 3.1% this year is our expectation. Again, it's keeping its head above water in large part because it's tracking to some extent with e-commerce spending, which is holding up really well. Now we're going to shift to talking about some of the specific consumer patterns that we've been seeing. So. Over the course of the year, we've been running a survey every two months where we ask, you know, have you bought in these various e-commerce categories? And you can see here what that was tracking like from February. 
so pre-pandemic to April, right in the heat of the, the worst parts of the pandemic, to June as we started to see some recovery effects. Um, what I'll highlight here, first of all, is these uh, categories that I've highlighted in red. Essentially, these are essential goods categories, pharmacy and health, household supplies, and food and beverages. And you'll see just a steady climb across all of those categories. So we're seeing this progression of those essential purchases moving to online. This was a trend we were seeing before the pandemic, but this has certainly been an accelerant. Now the discretionary goods categories, very different. I, I highlight here um, apparel at the very top and then uh, home furnishings a bit uh, below that. And what you'll see is that it kind of fell off in April. People really pulled back on those discretionary purchases, but then consumers started to get more cash through government stimulus, unemployment assistance, and that money got pushed back into the economy pretty quickly around May and June. So May and June were very strong for e-commerce. And you see how those numbers then jumped up quite a bit. Um, the home furnishings, that was also a very seasonal effect. So uh, a pretty precipitous climb there. Uh, but these are volatile categories and you're going to see a lot of these seasonal effects and, and a dependence on uh, government money. Okay, this um, slide takes quite a bit to unpack, but it's, it's kind of interesting. We're looking quarter by quarter at the growth rates across each channel. So total retail is that red line, e-commerce is the black line, and then non-e-commerce, which is brick and mortar, is the gray line. So you can see in 2019 what those numbers were running at, uh, fairly stable throughout most of the year. Then you get into Q1 and you see an acceleration in e-commerce. Um, we saw a bit of that pandemic effect at the end of March, um, but it was just early effects. And you start to see non-e-commerce or brick and mortar start to decline at that point. Q2, this is when everything gets magnified and you see just this dramatic fall off in uh, brick and mortar, unlike anything we've ever seen. You see a peak in, in e-commerce, um, but because e-commerce is a relatively modest percentage of total spending, really the brick and mortar effect dragged down that total retail number. So, you know, an unprecedented decline. I hate using that word because it's somewhat cliche at this point. I'll use it when it's very true. In this, in this case, it was very true. Then as you get through the balance of the year on e-commerce, you see that those numbers are still somewhat elevated, uh, but starting to come down as we expected people to get back into stores, brick and mortar starts to recover a bit. Um, I will say we already know that Q2, when the Department of Commerce numbers came out, it was over 40% growth. So uh, you should expect that this chart will change and that it will be more pronounced in Q2. You'll see a similar progression of decline throughout the year, but those numbers will stay elevated. What does that mean then for 2021? The reverse kind of happens as we assume that we get back to some level of normalcy um, in people getting back out into stores. And so because the comparisons to 2020 are so difficult in the case of e-commerce, you expect to see those numbers drop considerably. It's just really hard to grow on top of kind of an artificial growth in Q2, for example with the fact that it actually grew in the 40% range, you could easily see Q2 next year show a decline. Um, so I just wanna set expectations around that. At the same time, uh, next year, it doesn't mean that brick and mortar is gonna be better than it ever was. It just means it's gonna grow off a comparison of historic declines. So it kind of has to bounce back. Uh, it's still gonna take some time to get back to where it was from before the pandemic. Okay, so there's been a lot of talk um, about the acceleration of the e-commerce channel shift. And I wanna give some context here. So I've been showing some figures already that are represented by this red line. This adheres to the Department of Commerce definition of e-commerce as a share of total retail. Now, total retail includes some pretty massive categories that are largely spent offline. Um, and so that can have a skewing effect. So if those numbers seem somewhat modest or low, that's the reason why we still present them because that's the context through which we typically see them. Um, but I've provided other comparisons where we take some of the other categories out of the denominator. So the black line shows if you exclude auto and gas, which are basically not transacted online, that number in 2020 jumps from 14.5% to 20%. 
And then if you take out food and beverage, which is a trillion dollar category, um, that number actually jumps up closer to 30%. Um, in the past, that this was actually my preferred way of looking at e-commerce penetration, uh, but it was more justifiable, I would say five years ago when maybe 1% of food and beverage sales were happening online. We're starting to see dollars flow into this channel now, unlike ever before, the number is about 4% these days. Um, so I think that one gets a little bit harder to justify, uh, but it's still instructive to look at that context. So what's behind the channel shift? Uh, click and collect. So this has been a big part of what's happened. You take so many of these classic uh, orders that are happening in a store, think about what's happening with big box retailers and consumers are now going online on their mobile phones and they're putting that order through online so they can either go in and quickly pick it up in store or get curbside pickup. So we had originally forecasted back in February, pre-pandemic, a 39% growth rate in click and collect. So it was already an area of growth in e-commerce. Uh, we revised that upwards in May to 60.4%. Um, and with our new forecast coming out in September, you can expect that to go even higher. Now, unpacking some of the specifics in our survey, we asked people what their fulfillments, fulfillment methods were for digital orders. So delivery to home, still the dominant factor, but that hasn't really changed much throughout the, the course of the pandemic. Uh, picking up at the store, you can see it softened just slightly in April, maybe as people were really trying to stay out of stores, but then it kind of picked up a few percentage points by June. But picking up curbside, we see that that's where the real growth has been, went from 7% in February to 13% in April and 22% by June. So to me, this is where a lot of the new behavior, the incremental gains that are accruing to e-commerce are coming from today. All right, now we're gonna take a look at what's happening at categories. So I'm gonna have a few charts that are packed with information. Um, I'll talk about some of the highlights. Um, I think it's a good takeaway slide and, and charts that people can spend some time with. I won't get into all of it. But here, what we're looking at is all the key e-commerce categories and that trend in their penetration over time. And you can see I've got two 2020 numbers. The first one is what our initial estimate was in February pre-coronavirus. And then in our May forecast, where we started to factor in the effects of this, how much did that channel shift jump? And you can see that there are some pretty precipitous increases across uh, basically every category. Two that I'll highlight, books, music, and video. So this is the first ever category that we had expected even before the pandemic to surpass 50% of all sales in the category happening through e-commerce channels. So it is the first e-commerce majority consumer spending category. Um, that's expected to jump up even further to well above 60% um, this year. Now, consumer electronics, the largest category, was already uh, pretty well penetrated by e-commerce. And that number is going to jump from what we expected to be in the low 40s all the way up to just shy of 50%. So putting that in perspective, a huge category, and almost half of those dollars are now going through e-commerce channels. Here we're stack ranking the expected growth for all of the top e-commerce categories for 2020. And what I realized when I looked at this chart is that they really fell very neatly into different groupings. At the top of the list, you have the essential good categories, right? Food and beverage already was the fastest growing category online. Um, now that has magnified considerably in the pandemic. And then health, personal care, and beauty also growing strongly. The next categories, I would call these more discretionary categories. However, they have fulfilled very specific pandemic-driven needs. Uh, we need toys and activities in the home. We need computers, consumer electronics to assist us uh, with work from home or e-learning and those sorts of factors. Same thing with office equipment and supplies. So those categories have held up particularly well in e-commerce. And then at the bottom, the kind of underperforming categories relative to the overall benchmark have been what I would call kind of purely discretionary categories. 
So the most discretionary of all categories is apparel. Um, I've always looked at this category as the key holiday bellwether because it is kind of a re pure reflection of consumer demand. And as apparel goes, so goes the holiday season. Um, this has been true almost year in and year out over the 15 years that I've been following this. Now, what's interesting is this is expected to be the lowest performing category this year, the only single digit growth category, um, still 135 billion in expected sales for the year through e-commerce, but a growth rate of about 8.6%. Um, what I would say is this is not the bellwether this year, although I do think that because it's going to be the lowest performer, although I do think it reflects kind of the macro consumer demand effect. So this is kind of where we're at from a consumer demand standpoint, were it not for all of these kind of ancillary exogenous factors that we're experiencing because of the pandemic. Looking at what happened at apparel during the early days of the pandemic here, this is week over weekly sales data through e-commerce um, compared to the same week the prior year. And what you see from January up through the early part of March is that it was growing in a pretty healthy way, usually double digit growth rates. Um, and then the pandemic hits in that week of March 9th. And almost immediately you see demand pull back. Obviously as stores closed, this was, was much worse uh, at brick and mortar, but the demand dried up so much that, that we we're even going not just negative, but double digit negative in e-commerce channels as well. All of a sudden, mid-April, you start to see government assistance hit people's bank accounts and boom, that money starts to get spent again and on discretionary goods as well. So you see a big rebound effect in April, it continued into May and June as well. Uh, I'd be remiss if I talked about apparel without talking about leisure wear. Um, so there are some bright spots in the very big category of apparel. I'd say that the parts of the category that have suffered are uh, work wear, um, formal wear, you know, people aren't going out to summer wedding season. So all these things are high ticket purchases that really bolster the category. They bolster department stores, uh, but there are pockets of needs. Um, people have sort of leaned into sweatpants. So um, not every retailer can pull off the pivot to sweatpants, but there is uh, already a high propensity of buying within this category. It does skew younger. Um, and a number of people also expect to buy into this part of the category in the near future. Lastly, on the category side of things, consumer electronics. Once again, this is the biggest category. Um, it, it is highly discretionary, but it's actually performed very well. And we expect it to continue to perform well throughout the year because you've had several kind of peak events that have propped it up throughout the year. So in the early pandem pandemic, we had this shift to working from home. Now here we are in back to school season and you have e-learning. So all of a sudden you have uh, people buying laptops, tablets, workbooks, uh, Chromebooks really popular right now. And then all the associated accessories with that. And then as we get into the holiday season, Home entertainment is going to be, I think, a strong category. So that's going to drive uh, other purchases. You're probably going to have a strong gaming console season. So this category should continue to do well throughout the year. All right, let's look at some key retailer trends. Um, so this is probably one of our most visible charts uh, that, that people tend to see market share of e-commerce with Amazon uh, leaps and bounds above the rest. We expect Amazon to have uh, a market share of 38% this year. That will represent about a percentage point increase. So it will continue gaining share. Um, Walmart is number two. This is actually the first year that Walmart has leapt into that position with uh, several years of really strong e-commerce growth that's only been accelerated during the pandemic. Um, eBay has declined in share over recent years. Though I will say things seem to have turned around in the most recent quarter. Um, they're benefiting from the, 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 the tailwinds that they're getting from e-commerce. So we've seen some growth numbers there uh, that we haven't seen in the past couple of quarters. Then as you get into the middle of the mix here, Home Depot, Best Buy, Target, Costco, I would say 
this segment of big box retailers that are doing really well across all channels still um, for, for those trips where people do go into the store, um, they tend to do well. They're very good and sophisticated at click and collect. So they're meeting those needs and they're pretty strong on digital at this point. So they're doing well across the board um, and that's helped them move up the ladder. So what's driving Amazon's dominance? Um, I think that all traces back to Prime and Prime, how that just creates this habit around spending, spending more, more often into more different categories. Um, and a big part of that push has been convenience and a free and fast delivery as part of that. I love this visual because it shows the average amount of time from click to door. So when an e-commerce transaction occurs to when people receive it, and we're looking here at Amazon at the bottom uh, versus all other retailers. So you'll see the whole industry has gotten better, broadly speaking, over time. I think by Amazon being the pace setter here, um, the whole rest of the market has had to get better as well. So those delivery times have improved. Amazon invested inordinately in uh, 2019 um, by building out their infrastructure for next day prime. And that had a big impact. They went from 3.4 days on average all the way down to 2.2 by February. And then boom, you see this big uh, tick up here in March. Um, no surprise the pandemic created this log jam, uh, demand shock that you know the, the infrastructure just wasn't ready to support right away. Um, so delivery times have gone up understandably. Uh, but broadly speaking, the trend has been moving towards faster and faster delivery. No surprise then that Amazon has continued to penetrate categories in a pretty profound way. Um, I'll highlight two important ones for the holidays, computers and consumer electronics, which I think will be the biggest category once again this holiday season. Amazon is already going to be at 45% of total retail e-commerce sales. Um, and because that category is about split between online and offline now, Amazon's going to have about 22% of total category sales. Just a huge number. Books, music, and video, Amazon's first category, the best penetrated. They actually account for almost 80% of retail e-commerce sales now. Um, and within the context of the whole category, they're inching up towards 50% of all sales across channels. Amazon's success with e-commerce in Q2 was, as you say, staggering. And, you know, just to chime in about ad spending again, they also enjoyed some of the highest ad revenue growth that we saw from any major digital ad seller, um, especially in the U.S. I know that you've got some really nice predictions for us coming up for what's going to happen this holiday season, Andrew. So tell us, how is that going to play out? Yes, let's wrap it up with the holiday look ahead. So really quickly at a high level, I'll just run through these and then unpack them in detail. So um, this is a year where holiday sales will actually get pulled forward. I'll tell you why. Um, this will be the year of click and collect. Um, I actually said that last year, but I really mean it this year. I think we're going to see a, a major inflection point. Cyber Monday is going to hit the $10 billion threshold for the first time. Amazon is set for what will just be an epic uh, fourth quarter. And then on the category side of things, consumer electronics, hot apparel, not. Okay. So let's unpack this. So holiday spending will actually get pulled forward this year. Um, why is that? It's because prime day is going to be in October. So every year there's this cliche about holiday spending get, getting pulled earlier because promotions start earlier. Um, the evidence hasn't supported that in the past, actually. Uh, Consumers, you know, even though the promotions might be starting, consumers tend to congregate around tentpole events. And so most of the spending happens around Thanksgiving. Um, that sets off, you know, the heavy holiday season. Now, this year, we actually have an early tentpole with Prime Day that's happening in October. We don't know the exact date. It's probably going to be the early part of October. But because of when it's landing and because not only Amazon, but the whole uh, retail industry participates, we are going to see participation um, that gets people not only spending early, but thinking about those holiday purchases when they get into that shopping mindset. So they're going to get locked in and thinking ahead in a way that they haven't in past years. Um, this really presents a major opportunity for marketers 
uh, to use this event, one, to gauge holiday product demand, so see what's popular on Prime Day. It's probably a good predictor. It's a chance to get out and conquest versus competitors on that day, especially if they're pulling back their spending or, or reserving that spend for the holidays. You can go in and start communicating uh, and acquiring customers. And then once you've kind of shaken hands with that customer, plan to retarget them and communicate with them throughout October and November to build demand so that when they are ready to purchase again in November and during Thanksgiving, um, that you will be where they transact. The next one is that this will be the year of click and collect um, and more specifically curbside pickup. Um, so this is actually really important for retailers. You can see in this chart off to the right, the most important opportunities as retailers see it here in the US and the UK. Um, what does it represent? It's a chance to increase sales. So this, there's an incremental opportunity with click and collect for people who want that convenience component um, but can still fit that shopping trip without having to go into the store. So it can increase sales. It can drive more foot traffic. Some percentage of people who go there for a click and collect order will think of something else they need and they may transact in store. Um, it's a chance to increase profitability in part because with consumers leaning into e-commerce, you don't have to eat the costs of shipping uh, to make that sale, free shipping in particular, so you can actually offload that cost to the consumer because they're taking the effort to come to the store, even though they're transacting digitally. So I would say the, the tips for marketers are to make sure that you're communicating very clearly across all channels, whether that's in-store, uh, via email, or in-app um, about the availability of this click and collect. Make sure they know you have it and how to do it. If you have curbside, let them know. Um, and also, I would say lean into communicating about the importance of avoiding shipping delays. People are concerned about what's happening with deliveries this season. Um, so this is one way to allay their concerns. Third prediction is around the biggest shopping days. So Cyber Monday will once again be the biggest shopping day of the year. This is our forecast from the very beginning of this year. We had already predicted that Cyber Monday would surpass 10 billion for the first time. Uh, when we redo this forecast in short order here, um, I would expect it will be much higher, maybe on the order of 12 billion in spending. Now, all of these days in the Cyber Five tend to overperform the holiday season benchmark. I think that will be true once again. Black Friday and Cyber Monday will be the top days. That's in short. But Thanksgiving um, is where I think we're going to see the fastest growth rate, along with Singles Day. Singles Day is kind of an emerging holiday tent pole. It's not a huge day, but it's growing faster. But Thanksgiving is where people are going to be spending the fastest, um, in large part because holiday store closures are happening and people are going to be engaging in couch commerce. If you remember the last time Thanksgiving stores were really closed, people weren't really engaging in mobile commerce yet. So that's a big change from the last go around. Number four, uh, Amazon's Q4 will be one for the history books just because it's well positioned for the e-commerce boom. You can see uh, people are more interested in shopping online and shopping in app, in app that plays into Amazon's hands. Then you land Prime Day in the beginning of the quarter and any sort of residual benefit that Amazon gets uh, from that over the next weeks and into the holiday season, they're extremely well positioned. Um, but not all is lost. Competitors, I do think, have a good chance to counter program effectively against Amazon uh, based on perceptions of uh, having a differentiated product. Amazon does well in more commodity products. Um, people may, wanna, ne may not want to spend their money with Amazon when they can go and support local merchants, particularly in categories like toys and books. Um, so certain retailers can play into that. Um, and then curbside pickup. Amazon just can't match it. They really have that, you know, just with Whole Foods locations and maybe a few others. Um, so that is a, a competitive advantage for many retailers. And then lastly, which categories will be hot and which will not this year? Um, I think that electronics, as I mentioned before, you've got gaming consoles, you've got a lot of category diversity, um, and you have a lot of in-home entertainment needs that will drive that category in addition to toys and hobbies. Um, Specialty food and alcohol. Uh, people have really taken to sort of in-home gourmet cooking, things of that nature. So that category has been doing well, and I think we'll see that ramp up in the holidays as well. And then home fitness um, with people, I think, staying out of health clubs. This will kind of be the year of Peloton. 
Um, on the not as hot side, apparel once again will struggle because the occasions just aren't there to drive some of those higher ticket purchases. Um, and then appliances and furniture, I will say it's the high end of the, that category. They tend to do well where people buy for themselves, say on Black Friday. People are going to hold back on some of those thousand dollar purchases this season like they have in the past. Um, at the low end of the category, things will probably be okay, uh, but there, there will be a bite taken out of that. My recommendations, if you are in those categories, make sure for high end purchases, you have buy now, pay later options. Um, and then for apparel, I would say, start to get people thinking about kind of coming out of the cocoon and um, their post pandemic future. I mean, if you think ahead, you know, this year we had a lot of weddings, for example, or events that didn't happen. Um, you could have a really strong slate of that type of event happening next year. Get people thinking about that. Maybe now is a good time to be buying ahead for those occasions that they will have once again. And that's it for me on my content. Fantastic. Um, before we get to your questions live, we're going to hear a little bit from Outbrain. I said earlier we were going to be joined by Matt Peterson. Matt had a few technical difficulties. Instead, we have joining us Lauren Pika, who's Outbrain's head of marketing North America. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks for being here today. Thanks so much for having us, Nicole. We're super excited about this. Yeah, so um, to add to kind of the state of where we are, uh, the reason Matt couldn't join is because the double hurricane is kind of hitting close to home in Texas. And it just kind of sets the stage for where we're at. You know, we're not just here as sponsors. We're here because our world has been flipped upside down in a matter of months. There's COVID, there's systemic racism, there's just so much going on. And we're trying to tackle it both as consumers and as marketers. So the question really com becomes back to us, what can we do? How can we do better? Um, so while legitimate customer centricity has been a focus for some or a little bit in the background, it's really now had to become a focus for all. You know, our consumers are more aware and educated than ever before. And they're looking to us, not only to brand meaningfully in how we, we message ourselves, but also to support them with everything from those considerate messaging points to actual pandemic inspired product innovation. Um, so the bottom line really is consumer trust, right? It's something that we've all wanted and strive for every day, that brand loyalty, that trust, but now it's really something that we have to hone in on. And that goes from redefining brand safety to adapting to the new buyer journey, right? The new normal that we've heard reused so many times in, in all of the messaging. But then the question becomes, how do we do that online, right? You saw Andrew's presentation speaking to curbside pickup is pretty much the closest to that look, feel, touch that we're gaining from the in-store experience. So if all we have is online, how can we develop those in-person uh, interactions interactively through digital marketing and digital messaging? And you know, that really comes down to where, right? Everything starts to where your messaging, your brand, how you're talking to consumers and homing back in on where that might take place. Here's a perfect example. You know, we have data from our competitors to eMarketer to Comscore um, that really all tells the same narrative of news publications being extremely trusted. And that's on any given day. The data that we're viewing now was pre-COVID and we're still seeing that, you know, those native ads, those native placements on news sites are actually extremely much more trustworthy than something you might see on a social platform. But even further than that, it actually drives more purchases. Um, and that goes beyond, you know, the data we're seeing here. We can also look at data from Comscore on the next slide that Andrew actually worked on. Um, and this is actually beyond publications versus social or search, right? This is actually publishers versus publishers, seeing how premium news sites versus standard news sites actually perform. And we're seeing that premium-esque really come into play here, uh, as expected for some, but we have to know that publications and, and content is you know, more saturated than ever. 
And so we're even seeing a much, much higher brand lift at that middle funnel where more people tend to think it's upper funnel. So it's really interesting to see that. And then back on the next slide to that comparison, again, Andrew had just gone through this and this is actually Nicole's report. Um, you know, we're seeing the shifts. I know e-marketers have been changing their reports like crazy because every day it feels like something new is shifting. And this is one shift that we thought was immense, right? Search was supposed to grow 14% in 2019, and now it's declining in 2020. And that goes much beyond, yes, travel has a lot to do. Big travel brands really put a lot of dollars behind search, but it's also because people are searching for what's happening today. Am I getting my stimulus check? Are my schools reopening for my kids? You know, am I going to work? What's happening? Um, so it's really starting to set that stage. As I said, news, news sites were always important. We're always more trustworthy. But right now, that's where we're going. That's where consumers are going. So it's really a matter of being where they are, as we always say as marketers, but truly being where, where they are and meaningfully so. And just to add to Lauren's point, um, so she mentioned research I had worked on in another life at Comscore. Um, it was called the halo effect. And it was all about how the same ad campaigns just being seen in a premium context, you know, on a name brand publisher site um, across the board have a bigger impact, but the, but the impact is most profound in the middle of the funnel, which I think is the most underappreciated part of the funnel. We think a lot about display today. Um, it's moving more towards performance and it's certainly working well in that dimension. Uh, but in order to get those conversions, you need to build affinity for that brand over time. That's actually the hard part, you know, especially a lot of consumer brands that are already pretty well known. How do you get people not just to know the brand, but to want the brand? So when they are ready to convert, they're more likely to choose your brand. Um, so this is where I think that premium context does a lot of the he heavy lifting. Um, and it's very frequently underappreciated. So we've yeah. gone through a ton of really fantastic content already this morning, and I've got a long list of really great audience questions as well. But first, I've just got a few quick questions for Lauren before we get to those. So you talked a bunch about what a hectic year it's been with all kinds of shifts in the economy affecting consumers, marketing, and ad industry. How can brands best connect with consumers during this time? Yeah, so it, it's really tying back to, you know, what we covered in some of the data, what you guys have covered in some of the data. It's really kind of being where the consumers are, you know, as, as catchphrase as that sounds, it's just so true. And yes, we're on social for a reprieve from our days and we are on desktop even more than mobile sometimes because we're working so much from home if we're lucky. Um, but we're also constantly looking for what's happening next, right? It seems like we really never know what's coming tomorrow with everything that is happening. So we ask marketers to really consider new sites. And look, that does not have to be a push for Outbrain or any of the native ad platforms that are similar to us. That could also be a direct buy with some of your, your favorite publications, right? Those premium publications. They're struggling right now. You know, journalism rooms are closing and they're what we need now more than ever. So to kind of withhold sustainable journalism, but also connect with those consumers, it's really a matter of considering them in the greater mix of, you know, what is typically the Amazon, the social, the search play. It's also considering where you can, you know, not just be cost efficient, but also cost efficient and meaningful. Yeah. So, you know, just talking a little bit more about cost efficiency, marketers are facing tighter budgets this year, and they're probably pretty risk averse about what they're going to do with the money that they do have. Meanwhile, we're entering the holiday season, which is going to, you know, typically takes a big chunk of budget. So how can they manage that situation? Yeah, you know, we've seen there are some verticals that are that are taking a hit, and there are some verticals that I don't wanna say benefiting, but are, are performing okay throughout all of these inconsistencies and unknowns. But at the end of the day, we know that 50% of, of spend is done before even Cyber Weekend ends. And that's before the major December holidays into the new year, right? Also, luckily, as we're seeing in Andrew's data, holiday spend is not going down, right? While 50% of in-store might be 
dwindling, over 60% of online is actually jumping. Um, so it's really a matter of being meaningful in your approach, right? I think too often we look for the lowest CPA or the lowest CPL, depending on kind of business you are and how you can get those quick conversions. But to Andrew's point, you know, those upper funnel and the mid funnel, it also, it, it goes unnoticed sometimes. Yes, a quick conversion is great, but can a middle funnel that leads to a later conversion actually be more meaningful in terms of quality, in terms of spend? And, yeah. you know, you might see a differentiation of, well, it might have taken five leads on social versus one lead on a major publication, but that one lead ended up spending a lot more in their ad department. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's really just trying to be meaningfully, uh, meaningful in your approach and your messaging, but also understanding it's not all about the quick conversion anymore, especially now that we know, you know, holidays coming sooner given the, the delay of Prime Day. Yeah. So one other thing that's been going on besides the pandemic is the long awaited death of the cookie. We're soon entering a cookie list world. How is that going to affect brands' ability to ensure their? They're using, again, those potentially decreased marketing budgets in the most efficient way possible. Yeah. So I'm not going to lie. I may or may not have had cookies, Oreo cookies for breakfast. So maybe it's inspired this response in me. But let's be honest, this whole cookie conversation has been going on for a while, right? Other platforms have already done this. and We've been preparing for Google doing this for some time. I think back to that meaningfully piece. It doesn't always have to be about these crazy demographic targeting and, and following around your users, right? Coming back to trustworthiness, is there a value exchange to you having that level of information on your consumers, on your users? And it kind of brings the conversation back to contextual, right? Um, it's something that we strongly believe in. If you ever want to look at your interest profile on what like a native ads provider might know about you, it's not much. We more than anything care about what you're interested in based on the type of content that you're consuming. And you don't need to drop cookies for that when you have hard code on site, right? So it's a matter of really just, again, meaningfully, you're not going to lose your attribution model by, by taking more of a contextual approach. And you're probably going to get much loyal customers by taking that approach, right? Because they're, they're actually getting to know you. They're not just coming in for the quick conversion and never engaging with you again. Yeah. So I think the cookies, the cookies, the cookie, the cookie is food for me, breakfast. <laughs> Uh, so I think you've already probably hit on some of these points, but just in case there's any others you want to mention, what are some of the top reasons that marketers should be considering native ads this season? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm marketing, right? I, I'm not a salesperson. <laughs> I, I'm here for, for many reasons because I believe in eMarketer, but I work at Outbrain for a reason too. I've been here for almost four years and it's not just about pitching native ads and pitching our company. There's so many beliefs that I personally as a marketer have with native advertising and I could go on forever, but we have a lot of questions to, to come on to with everybody on. But like I've said, in nauseam, it's that meaningful interactivity, right? Especially now when we don't have those in-store experiences how can we provide interactive native experiences online, right? A lot of brands like Outbrain and platforms like us have video, have carousel that really mimic that, that in-store, that look, touch, feel experience as best as we can. And in a place where people actually want to interact with you, right? When they're in that deep consumption mode, as they're reading whatever article update they're getting on COVID or you know, whatever article they're reading. Everybody, everybody is uh, behind their own computer. Whatever them. their own contextual interests are. Yeah. Nobody knows what I'm <laughs> reading on here, right? You all might think I'm interested in business, but clearly I'm interested in Oreos. Um, it also comes down to the brand safety element, right? Being hard coded on those publisher pages, being where, as we saw with the, with the Comscore data, premium publishing really does have a big difference in terms of that consumer trust. And with that trust become, comes a level of brand safety and brand integrity that a lot of brands are comfortable with. We do have to be a little bit careful with some of our block lists. You know, a lot of people are worried of being incorporated with COVID messaging, but you're actually losing a huge amount of consumers by, by doing that. Conversation for a different day. Find me on LinkedIn if you want to talk about that. 
Um, but then there's also growth, right? And when we think growth, we think reach or scale, those typical buzzy words, but it's, it's more than that, right? Just like the meaningful messaging will hopefully lead to meaningful ROAS. It's also thinking beyond that first conversion. And being at Outbrain for four years, this is what I've seen us do for so many brands. And it's why I think you should potentially consider us for holiday. So we're, we're low on time, but I really do have some really good questions. And I know there's still a lot of folks watching. So we're gonna try to squeeze in at least three live questions here at the end. Um, I know that Andrew, you are really interested in various forms of click and collect growing. And Sarah in Minnesota took note of the slide that you showed earlier with the various changes in delivery methods being used. Um, she knows that curbside jumped to 22%. She's curious what the outlook is for the rest of 2020 and even into 2021. Do you see this is just a pandemic related trend or is this going to stay when we reach that kind of new normal later on? I think most of it's going to stay. Um, that's the quick answer. So what's happened is that click and collect as a trend is one of these things that um, you have to think about the demand and supply side factors. So the supply wasn't there. In other words, a lot of retailers a few years ago didn't have click and collect capabilities. As soon as they operationalized it, consumers took to it in a big way. So the behavior was ready and waiting. The demand was already there. So as soon as it was, a, it was enabled, it took off. Now we're seeing that with curbside people. Actually, we had a great predictor, which was Target unveiled their curbside. And it was like, unbelievably popular right from the outset. The rest of big box retailers got into the act and it started taking off there, all of this pre-pandemic. Now what do you have is local merchants realize if they wanna make the sale, they have to have it. So we have just gone ahead, you know, a few years in time in terms of operationalizing something that probably would have been slower moving and consumers have become habituated to it. By the way, early in the pandemic, I would have thought this was kind of a flash in the pan, a few month thing, and that most of those behaviors would recede. Well, if it goes on for six, nine, 12 months, people start to get accustomed to it. So yeah. while we will revert to some extent to more normal brick and mortar shopping patterns that will happen, um, some of those behaviors will get locked in long term. Yeah, it's definitely long enough to start, start being habit forming for some of these things. Um, so Andrew, I think this is, this is going to be primarily another question for you. Mandy in New York, um, she notes the early holiday kickoff because of Prime Day uh, shifting to October. She's wondering what percent of Cyber Week sales we think that will pull forward. I know you talked about that a little bit, but I'm hoping you can go into a little bit more detail because she's also wondering if we're expecting any kind of like a lull where we have a spike on Prime Day, a lull around the election and then spiking again toward the cyber weekend. Yes, uh, so I think the patterns are really interesting. One, I will say you will probably start to hear a lot of predictions about the fact that Prime Day, you'll probably see headlines like Prime Day is the new Cyber Monday or that Prime Day will pull from Cyber Monday. Um, I disagree really strongly with that, and I'll tell you why. Prime Day will be Prime Day. It's going to be a big event. There are certain purchases that will happen on Prime Day that might have happened on Cyber Monday, but it's probably going to pull from other parts of the season. Consumers are still going to congregate around those promotional periods. Um, and I think that, like I said, all of those days in the Cyber 5 period are going to be as big as ever. You also have just this huge sort of unanticipated bucket of spending that's moving into e-commerce in general. And it's still going to concentrate around those key days. So it's not a zero sum game. Don't think of it as one day gets big. So the other one has to get uh, worse. Um, it's that all this new spending is going to help all of e-commerce and most of it will concentrate around all of the available promotions. Yep. And then I've just got time for one last question. This one's from Samantha in Texas, who I hope you're still watching and not having those same hurricane related problems. But she asks, last year, the bulk of online shopping during the holiday season was with a few key players like Amazon, Walmart, Target, Best Buy. With something like 40% of shoppers starting their search on Amazon, this is something that I've covered a bunch in the past. 
But she's wondering, with the supply and demand disruptions that we've been seeing throughout the pandemic, do we think that consumers are still going to flock to those big names looking for reliability? Or is there going to be a wider spread because of out of stocks and you're just going to be forced to look beyond those big box and major retailers? There's definitely opportunities, um, Lauren. I don't know if you have additional thoughts on, on other marketers, but um, there's going to be opportunities to take some of those sales. We saw that. I mean, Amazon had this explosive second quarter, and yet at the same time, they lost sales to some competition. In fact, for parts of the quarter, their market share went down in e-commerce. Yep. Um, so all these things can be true. Uh, so Amazon is going to have a, a really big quarter but there's probably more opportunities for others to come in and conquest. And again, market against some of these disruptions that, that um, you know, don't play to Amazon's strengths. Um, now, I do think a lot of the kinks have been worked out. It was a lot harder when you didn't expect this pandemic and this demand shock, and then they had to scale up you know, logistics and last mile delivery and all that. They're more ready for it in this go around. Um, but you know, now we have the USPS issues. So there's still uncertainty around that. Consumers are concerned. So I would say the opportunity is to market to them around the fact that they have uncertainty, even if some of the big players are fairly well equipped at this point to handle it. Thanks, that was fantastic, Andrew. Unfortunately, that's all that we have time for this morning. Thanks again, Andrew, for that really great presentation and a very special thanks to Lauren for jumping in and the rest of the team at Outbrain. Our eMarketer production crew behind the scenes also deserves, as always, a huge thank you for making this webinar possible. And thanks to all of you for watching and for sending in those fantastic questions. As promised, we'll be emailing you soon with a link to the slides and the full recording of this webinar. If you're interested in more webinars like this, please visit eMarketer.com webinars and you can check out what's coming up. Don't forget to also check out our daily podcast, Behind the Numbers. I have a bi-weekly show on Wednesdays called The Ad Platform. Please also check out the eMarketer and Business Insider Intelligence newsletters, including our morning briefing on digital marketing, media, and e-commerce trends. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your workday.